Hello everyone, my name is Hilmar and welcome to a very special episode of Hex Noir. Uh, this is going to be our very first post-mortem where we take a look at a recent story that just finished and I sort of go through the creative process of how it came to be and what to expect in the future. So let's just get right into it. So the inspiration for Hex Noir came from a multitude of places. This was a story that initially kind of came about in my head in a very different form back when I was working on a different series, uh, one called Frontier, which is a kind of fantasy sci-fi story, which uh, primarily used to I used to primarily release chapters bi-weekly on a website called Tapas. I used to post uh, web comics and such there in, back in the day as well. Now, over the course of time, I kind of got a little bit, not tired of that story, but this sort of aesthetic that I created for that story of like, you know, very sci-fi spaceships and whatnot, but indulged with fantasy elements, I kind of got a little bit tired of it. And so my brain started going more and more into old wells and old ideas that have been just kind of slumbering in the back of my head. You know, more gothic, more Victorian kind of horror ideas, ideas of blood magic and industrial cities. And it just kind of something sort of ideas can be kind of cancerous in a way where once an idea takes root in your head, it, it can sometimes just not let go. And that is very much what happened with Hex Noir. It was probably in December of 2021. I just moved back home to Iceland from the US. Uh, COVID was still very much a thing and I was just kind of burned out on a lot of things and I was just sort of sketching things and coming up with ideas and the kind of idea of a sort of arcane punk story first popped into my head and infused with sort of sort of these Victorian aesthetics and I was like oh this this sounds really cool this sounds really dope um, it didn't help that arcane had just come up or it just had just been released uh, not that long ago so that sort of art deco Victorian Gothic architecture thing was very kind of fresh in my mind. Uh, and I guess that is a, a, a great place to kind of start veering into the various inspirations that made Hex Noir. Uh, the primary inspiration for Hex Noir is obviously Bloodborne. Bloodborne is my favorite game, possibly of all time. I will defend this game to my dying breath this is a hill I am willing to fucking die on. Bloodborne is a masterpiece. It is unparalleled, unrivaled in terms of its sheer excellence and just atmosphere. Like, holy fuck. A lot of the kind of gothic Victorian vibes that Hex Noir has originate a lot from Bloodborne. Uh, and some of the earliest ideas of blood magic came from Bloodborne as well. And we'll go to that a little bit later. Another thing that inspired me deeply in a lot of things that I work on and write is Berserk. I've never really watched any of the animes uh, uh, except for the 2016 one and I immediately was just like, this is not the right way to, uh, to <laughs> read Berserk or to, to experience Berserk. And so I got acquainted with the manga and just have never looked back. That is an amazing series. It is not for everyone, and I would not recommend it for everyone. And I would definitely send a whoever would pick up that series. I would send a list of trigger warnings because that that series is brutal. That is that one is real brutal. Now, what I one of the things that I really love about Berserk is its characters and following a, a group of characters that you really, 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 really love through the countless ordeals that the dark world that kind of 
in, uh, kind of surrounds them at every given at every given moment uh, is really what keeps you coming back. A horrible thing has happened, but you just cannot stop reading because you want you want to see these characters do well. You want them to be happy. Another uh, big inspiration is the video game series Dishonored. The art style and kind of subject matter of those games is so up my alley. I love Dishonored and I fuse a lot of Dishonored vibes into Hex Noir. It was, it was one of those kind of like visual aesthetics that immediately became a, 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 f a fixed point in my uh, my Pinterest board for Hex Noir, which by the way, stands currently at 491 pins. I'm still growing, I'm still finding new new things to like draw inspiration upon. Uh, two more things that, or two kind of new, uh, blah, blah, blah. two more primary things, <laughs> you can tell I'm a great speaker. Two more primary things that I drew inspiration from was the Dead Space series and Arcane. I love Dead Space. I love space horror and I love the idea of uh, being isolated somewhere, or characters being isolated somewhere and having to fight their way out to survive. And the, the prologue arc is absolutely that to a T. Arcane also like what what a series what a what a great inspiration to uh use for character motivations and like how to have a, a big cast of characters with conflicting ideals and whatnot and hex noir hasn't quite become that yet but we'll get into that uh, and then finally the final thing that has just been an inspiration to me for years is D and D and tabletop RPGs and playing those types of games with other people and the type of world building that they encourage and sometimes uh, progressive and collaborative storytelling, because I mean, if D DMing for D and D taught me so much about world building and and creating you know uh, plot hooks and interests and intrigue and characters and to sort of compartmentalize that and not have to do all of it or have everything ready at the same time or right from the word go uh, because I mean if you're going to try to have a complete world by the time you start a series like this especially if you're trying to do it serialized week by week like I did which I mean I would not recommend to anyone it is going to burn you out and what a lot of like pro dms like brendan lee mulligan uh bria iyengar and matt mercer and all those all the greats what they will typically tell you is like you don't have to have everything ready all at once don't try that have a general idea of how everything works and then have it, the broad sto strokes ready and slowly but surely as you begin to write it or flesh it out flesh out certain aspects and let that inform what the rest kind of looks and feels like and if you if you kind of did your homework or your prep work well enough then it's not going to feel like oh this this sticks out in like a weird way or anything uh but instead of it'll feel like you had a co cohesive vision the entire time did that happen with the prologue arc i'm i i like to hope so i like to hope that people read through the thing and were like yeah he absolutely knew where this was going the whole time which is a yes and no kind of answer to to that sort of um proposition or that idea and then the, the, one of the final things regarding the the development of this or like how this series came to be. I had been writing serialized fiction for a long time, whether it was in webcomics or just in uh, like web novels and tapas. Uh, but I'd, I'd noticed that people were less likely to like sit down and read a chapter, even if it came out like weekly or bi-weekly. And so I started entertaining the idea of like doing an audio drama or like just 
writing those chapters down and then reading them and recording. And I sort of toyed with this idea of like, I'm, I'm not much of a performer. I don't like, I'm an animator by trade. I'm an illustrator. I like to world build and I like to write. I'm not a performer, but I can like kind of hold my own, I suppose. So I had kind of contacted a friend of mine who is a performer, who is a voice actor. And she was very much on board with, with doing this series. Uh, but through some delays and heavy workloads on both of our end, uh, and me not being very happy with the, the story that I had in my head at that point, we decided to kind of delay it a little bit. But here's the problem. Even while delaying things, I am very manically obsessive and sometimes just cannot let things lie. And so while there was nothing really to do, my brain just went like, hey, what about those characters over there that you had in your initial story? You're probably not going to do this initial story, but what if you take those characters? What if you like make a backstory for them? What if you like flesh that out? And I'm like, yeah, that's great. And that's how I ended up making a prequel without a main cool. <laughs> The, pro the prologue arc is a prequel to nothing. There is no story to be a prequel to, but it's the origin story of some characters that will become prevalent later on, which is a very bizarre way to tell a story. I don't know if I would recommend it, but I thought it was really funny. Now, getting into the story development of, of Hex Noir or of the prologue, at first, it wasn't a prologue, really. Not really. It was just Hex Noir, which is why at the start of every chapter, I just say Hex Noir chapter, blah, 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 blah. You know, you've heard it. But it kind of became that. And it was sort of always meant to be that. Again, you know, cohesive vision, but not all the details. Like, I knew this was a prologue, but I hadn't really even made that connection myself until much, much later. Uh... But the way I approached this was that I wrote the first chapter and then I edited it, edited it, and then I was like, okay, I think this is cool. Did some concepts of the, the twins, uh, Alba and Luna, and then re-recorded, or then I recorded everything and used sound effects and music from, uh, from Artlist and just made kind of a test episode, which ended up just being the first episode the first chapter and I was like I think this is I don't want to say good but I think I'm kind of happy with this at the very least and so I just in a weird spur of the moment just kind of did it like the pro like all just started with me being like i I can't sit and not do anything so I'm going to write something and then I just recorded it and then I just published it and then I was like oh shit I kind of have a series on my hands and I kind of put this out. There's an, already an episode one or a chapter one. I kind of have to do the rest. And I was like, yeah, that's fine. They're, they're fighting their way through the hospital. Yeah, but what next? What happens next? Where's this going? And I was like, ah, oh, I, I don't know. And so, you know, the day after chapter one had released and I'd like sent to some of my like friends and my like my D D buddies and pals and I was like hey I made a really weird thing it's a horror thing here here we go uh and I just ran away um after that I just kind of sat down I was like okay okay okay, okay. let's do a fucking outline let's get a general overview of like where the story is going what characters are going to be introduced what their everybody's character arc is going to be and I kind of kept it a little bit loose and I was just like Broad strokes, the twins are going to go there. They're going to meet this dude. Something's going to happen. Bad stuff is going to happen. They're going to meet some soldiers. Then they're going to escape from them. Then they're going to go into a basement. And then they're going to find a doctor. And then escape, going to try and escape from there. Ending. And that was kind of it. And like the motivations of everybody was kind of set. But everything changed as I kind of continue to flex, flesh out the story. General vibes. Everything was there. I knew what a kind of the the themes and sort of the motifs of everything i i i had all those things down but a lot of things changed as i was writing them chief among them was nikolai nikolai initially had a very very different role he was supposed to come in in chapter three 
he was supposed to explain the situation to Alba and Luna, who still had a bit of a memory lapse thing. He did as well, but he had been awake a little bit longer. And he was supposed to kind of like explain the power system and kind of set them on the path of like, we can escape through these, this, this, the, the, the front entrance or the body chute. And that was going to like set them on that path. And then he was supposed to die. He was supposed to die in like episode four or five. But a weird thing happened. I sat down to write the third chapter. And I wanted to just start with a flashback of Nikolai and how like he came to be there. Just as to give him a kind of character motivation of like, who is he? What is he trying to do? I knew he, his, his, his motivation was that he wanted to get out to go back to his sick mother. He was supposed to fail at that. That was going to be his character arc. It wasn't really much of a character arc. He was supposed to be there as a supporting cast and then he was going to die and just be out of the story. But then I wrote that intro and I don't know what happened. I fell in love with this guy. I, I felt so bad for him and his sick mom. And I was just like, oh, no, I love this dude. I, I can't kill him now. What the fuck am I going to do? And so the story changed. At first, it was always just going to be the twins going from one horrible situation after another. But the way I kind of set the story up to begin with and the way I knew I wanted it to end, it made sense that Luna would succumb to her frenzy, to her bloodlust. I was like, I've set this up. Let's pay it off. But even that later changed because it was supposed to be that she succumbed to her frenzy and just kind of went off wild and eventually regained her consciousness and kind of came back and it was going to be like this sort of narrative tension of like can we trust her or can't we and then that even changed I was like that doesn't make any fucking sense so she just kind of dips out for a little bit and then she comes back and is like well we're now we're united yay let's go on with the original plan no that that's not interesting at all she has to be a villain she has to be a secondary villain that just kind of a sort of relentless killer type of character who just keeps on coming after them and that made so much more sense and now Alpa and Nikolai became this unlikely duo that they were never meant to be and Luna became this sort of ravenous monster that became kind of the this sort of uh, this kind of unattainable goal for for Alpa to like reclaim her sister and then get out and the way all that went just kind of became sort of synonymous with how this world works you get a couple of wins but mostly it's just L's mostly you're just taking the beating and another thing that kind of changed was Dr. Brimwell he went he originally in my outline was just a mad scientist that was that was kind of it he was just a mad scientist he just like had an apocalyptic idea or a plan and like the thing that happened at the end that was supposed to be intentional on his part but then it kind of pivoted and i was like that's also not very fun that's also not very interesting what if i shift his character and it becomes more of like him being this accidental villain and when i say accidental villain villain i mean he doesn't see himself that way he has this thing of like, he thinks he's the good guy, but he's had to make some bad choices and you should probably feel sorry for him. And I really wanted that to kind of convey a little bit of like, there are a lot of people in, in real life who think that explaining things equals justifying them. And that's just not right. That's not correct. Um, and there's a lot of people who fall for that. And that is very predatory and you should not let people get you that way and I thought it was really interesting to kind of explore that a little bit through Brimwall of like being this guy who was so convinced that he was a good guy and he was just doing the hard thing uh, the difficult things that just needed to be done and oh it's like if you know, if only you would understand how sad he is and like it doesn't matter you still did fucking horrible things and I, I, at that point, he became a very interesting character for me to write. And I wanted that a lot more. Now, in terms of things that 
did stay consistent, things that did not fluctuate at my every manic whim, um, the themes, for instance, themes of oppression and classism, of religious persecution, of injustice and tragedy, and of course, above all else, the blood magic. All of these things were kind of already baked into the world, although still just in general brushstrokes, all these things then kind of informed every creative decision that I sort of made after that. Because again, this was very much a sort of laying the train tracks in front of the moving train type of storytelling. I was figuring shit out as I went along. A lot of stuff I knew and a lot of stuff I was patiently kind of working my way towards and I'm st I still am. But then also the other half of it was just kind of me being like, oh, I don't, I don't really know. I'm, I'm miming holding a thing. I'm holding a, a, a crocheted dice bag that somebody gave me. Oh, I don't really know what this thing is. I'll just put this here. And then a couple of weeks later, I'm like, oh, wait, that thing is there. That's actually a perfect kind of segue into this other kind of plot thing. You know, you just kind of half pants it. Part, a part of the story is really well thought out and you're definitely building up towards something. The other half is just like, I don't know, I really hope this kind of turns out okay. <laughs> okay, anyways. And you kind of just move on, just move forward, keep keep making things and move forward. That's that's my <laughs> that's my motto. Uh, J.R. Tolkien, I am definitely not. Another thing that definitely stayed consistent was my love for blood magic. I love blood magic to a, a an unsettling degree. Uh, weirdly enough, the or maybe fittingly enough, uh, my the initial roots and inspirations for my love for blood magic came through Bloodborne, which, as a game, doesn't exa exactly have blood magic in it. It has some blood related powers and you know some weapons there there are a couple of weapons that or at least there's one weapon i think it's the chikagi that you it's like a it's kind of like a samurai sword and you kind of stab yourself with it and then you pull it out and now it's like imbued with your blood and now it's longer there's also kind of like a battle maze thing that you can get in one of the dlcs that sort of does the same thing that idea sort of permeated in my head for years and like in its initial form, it was like, oh, what a cool way to kind of rethink vampires of like making them blood mages. And then like, yeah, you can sacrifice your own blood to like cast spells. But what if you sacrifice the, the blood of others? And then it becomes like this weird thing. And that idea, we we're talking about this. This started like permeating in my head at like 2015, 2016. It's a long time ago now. And it kept being there developing in the back of my head for years just like a like a like a slow killer and then i got introduced to D, &D and through that to critical role and through that to matt mercer's blood hunters and blood magic and that immediately kind of picked or pushed some buttons that i had forgotten I had and I became absolutely infatuated with the idea of like hemocraft as he calls it and that sort of started bringing like these early 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 developments of hex noir before it became like an active thing that I was doing and I mean my, my love for blood magic just feeds into my incessant need for horror and just terrible nastiness. There's just always something in me that loves a dark fantasy story. Although I like my horror and my dark fantasy and grim dark fantasy to not just be nothing but doom and gloom and just pain and misery, because otherwise then what the fuck are you even tuning in for? But just the sort of darker horror aesthetics, I love that shit. I fucking adore that shit. And Hex Noir is definitely me playing into these these sort of horror inclinations that I have already. Another thing that stayed consistent sort of throughout the entire endeavor, weirdly enough, was Alba. She was the only character who didn't change almost at all. There was a couple of changes that I made, but I will get into that much, much later. Not in this postmortem, maybe potentially somewhere down the line. 
hint, hint, nudge, nudge. But the kind of core characteristics of who Alba was and who she would become were always there because she was the original character that I picked out from that initial story idea that I had. And I was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a, a prequel to her. I'm going to make a, a backstory to her. And so I always kind of had a strong idea of whom she was going to become. And among those things were this sort of sense of powerlessness. She had to be a weak, a physically weak character who had powers that had potential. But I also wanted her powers to feed into this need for control. If she's a powerless character and she's being pushed around all the time, then having a power where she can negate that can be very useful. It can also feed into some dark, dark urges and dark desires. And I mean, yeah, having mind control power sounds really cool until you really start to digest the the ramification of just taking over somebody's mind and puppeting them. That is a horrifying idea and probably leaves a fuckload of trauma behind it. And that also kind of built upon her willingness to do questionable things. Like you're, you you, can't really give your characters dark powers if you're not going to have them indulge a little bit in it. And you definitely see her do that, which again brings us into the, the final thing that stayed consistent the entire time, right from the start. And it's a thing that Alba actually says about halfway through. Nobody's getting out of this with their hands clean. That is kind of the weird sort of storytelling through line of Hex Noir so far. It's just, there are terrible things happening and you're probably gonna have to do terrible things to get out. This is not a world where things are fair or where you have the luxury of making good moral decisions, but that doesn't necessarily excuse the terrible de decisions that are being made either. And of course, all of that is just sort of gothic horror to a T. Now, of course, this being ultimately revealed to just be nothing but a very extensive prologue, there's a lot of things that are happening sort of behind the scenes. There's a lot of slow burn buildup of numerous terrible things. On one hand, you have the the Warlings and also the oppressive society that they are kind of doomed to inhabit. At the very start of the story, you have the twins kind of going out of Fellhaven. You get this brief description of its sort of industrial, monstrous nature. And you kind of come back to it again at the end. And of course, that is not an accident. That is very much by design. Because whatever comes next is going to be taking place in Fellhaven. So we have a bit of a prologue outside of it, get some brief glimpses into its society, and then we begin to submerge into it. Then it's also building up the, the elite, the nobles, the military, the government, the, the kind of the monarchy or the dynasty, the empire that they belong to. I, <laughs> obviously a lot of our uh, own sort of ideals and inclinations feed into our own work. Have any of you noticed that I don't like authority? Have you ever noticed that? Maybe a little bit. I'm not a big fan of monarchies. I'm not a big fan of most governments. I think a lot of, I think elitism and nobles are, is just fucking bullshit. Um, and you know, if that didn't come across well enough, well, chapter eight is named Eat the Rich, very much for a reason. And then of course there is the church. This is, I don't want this to be a, an anti-religion story. I'm not an anti-religious person. I'm not a particularly religious person anymore. I have some religious backgrounds, but I respect religions and I am still in part deeply spiritual. What I do not respect are various religious institutions. And I don't think that's going to stop anytime soon. The religion itself or faith in general is not really the issue. It's the institutions that spring up around them. 
that's where the issue is. And then among other things that are being slowly, slowly built up is the beyond. And I really, I wanted, the characters just had to go in there for one chapter. It just They just had to. You know, not only to like develop more spiritual or more supernatural powers of their own, but also just to kind of give a bit of a hint of like this place beyond understanding, but not make it beyond structure. There, I, 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 I was, I was talking to a a friend of mine who, uh, does, uh, is one of the hosts of the uh, a bold opinion podcast. I would absolutely recommend you guys to go check that out. They are wonderful. They, they review video game adaptations and then talk about how they could be better or what worked or what didn't. So we were talking about eldritch horror and how a lot of it can sometimes feel in an effort to make it be unknowable it can instead just feel unstructured so less like there is a particular purpose to what is happening that you just don't understand and more like the writer doesn't even know what's going on and if the writer doesn't know what's going on then it's it's just nothing essentially but at the same time, if the writer does know what's going on and wants to kind of hint at it, it's really hard to give small tidbits of like understanding in something that's supposed to be truly alien and eldritch and unknowable. So that was something that I really wanted to try with the beyond of like sprinkling in things and concepts, these little like hints of like what is happening here. But without it being like, oh, this is clearly what is happening now. To try and make something unknowable without it making without making it feel just ridiculous and unstructured, I, I suppose. But I also wanted to kind of give a, some hints into what it might be. Because it's going to play a huge part later on. And another thing that I, I, I kind of wanted to hint at a little bit although it feels so left field it feels so just kind of out of the blue not really in keeping with anything here is the idea of hilder these kind of fey or hidden folk inspired creatures kind of like goblins and and kobolds and like less of like the, their D D contemporary forms but more of like their kind of old archaic sort of you know nature spirits or household spirit kind of form and I kind of wanted to explore that, and that is something that will be explored eventually. But it, it's it's a really silly and goofy idea in a story about specifically like blood magic and experimentation and you know elitism and classism and all that stuff. And you just have a little chapter there as it's like, oh yeah, also goblins are real? Question mark. Although again. It serves a little bit of a point since eventually through over time there's going to be more introductions into like different supernatural things and this is just kind of like the first taste of that so we've been talking a lot about how the development of this story came to be uh but what's next because the story definitely ends on either the, a, a terrible fucking downer ending or a huge cliffhanger and it's kind of not really meant to be either or or both yeah that's a non-committal answer i'll go i'm gonna go with that so the way this is going to work going forward is there's going to be more stories to tell but they're not going to be necessarily a unified series i suppose more individual stories taking place in the same world and each one is a continuation of the world to try and give this world a more fleshed out and nuanced feel to make it feel like it's ever developing and, and evolving. And with every single iteration, something changes. And the next time with the next story, you're going to feel like this is the same world, but it has grown. It has become something a little bit different. It's, 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 it's developing. It's, it's like the real world. It's fluid. It's in motion. I don't really like status quo storytelling. I like change. Change can be difficult, but it can also be really rewarding, I think. It's really, really fun to like come back to a series 
and see that the world has changed, that the characters have changed, that the status quo has changed. And I think that's important. That's kind of what I sort of want to explore as we go on. It's, it's, Hex Noir uh, is probably going to just sort of become a, an umbrella term, if you will. It's, a, it's a, dare I say, a brand name. The anti-commercialist that I am, dread to say it, but yeah, it's it's a platform for storytelling. And for now, all these stories are going to be taking place in the same world. You know, uh, for now, we're going to be, the next story is going to be a sort of quasi-continuation of what the prologue set up. It's going to take place after the Black Moon descended upon Fellhaven. We're going to explore the ramifications of that. What happened? Did the world end? No, definitely not. But what did happen? How did it affect the society? How did it affect its people? And we're going to hone in on a very specific cast of characters that were afflicted by this. And then we're going to continue on from there. And with each story, we're going to kind of explore different points of view from a wider range of characters. And we're going to unearth different long forgotten aspects of the world through character driven drama, essentially, and potentially, possibly, hopefully someday later, maybe something different, something beyond Fellhaven. Right now we're kind of focusing on this particular world, this particular city. And this particular type of storytelling, but eventually it might evolve into something more, something, some different kind of stories. This is a platform of evolution. This is a platform of evolution, I suppose. So, yeah, I think that's what I'm going to embrace. And now, so comes to an end this first postmortem. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned some interesting things about the development of this really fucking bizarre series uh and i hope it it makes you excited for what's to come uh i i really want to say to anyone who actually listened to the the prologue chapters who to other people who 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 liked the videos on youtube who you know rated the the show on 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 spotify to anyone who who commented or sent me messages like uh, there, there's only a handful of you but my god it absolutely makes my day to see uh what you guys thought of the episodes and like getting involved in in the <laughs> the goings on of the the fellhaven royal hospital and it, it just it makes it so much fun to share these stories, to see that, you know, people out there are enjoying them. And if you are enjoying these stories, you know, like, comment, and subscribe, all that jazz. I hate pushing that message forward, but it does help, you know. Together, we, we, we're a coven. We're all kind of building this sort of heathen, witchcrafty coven of dark tales that we are weaving and enjoying together. So you know, help that coven grow. Soon we will control the world with our heathen ways. <laughs> uh, and finally, new stories are coming out soon. So stay tuned. And yet again, thank you so much for listening to my weird, goofy stories. Thank you for engaging. Thank you for listening to this. And thank you for uh, just being a part of this. I super enjoy it. I'm very excited to tell more tales with you guys. I'm excited to hear what you think of them, whether you like them or hate them or whatever. I love telling stories and I will continue to do that until the day that I die. So here's to you and here's to many more stories with you. All right. Thank you guys. See you.